So this is my group. Uh, I'm at Temple University. I'm a professor of chemistry there, and my I teach organic chemistry, and now I am a synthetic organic chemist. I make molecules. My lab makes molecules. Actually, I program, and they all make molecules. None of them do any programming uh, yet. So uh, what I'm going to show you is what I've been working on my whole life, which is I want to be able to build molecules, build functional molecular devices that uh, as easily as I can write code. Uh, because I believe, I know, that down at the molecular level are the solutions to all of our problems. So um, the first person to really articulate this idea was Richard Feynman in 1959. He had this lecture that probably some of you have seen. It's called There's a Plenty of Room at the Bottom, where he first sort of postulated the idea of building a machine smaller and smaller and smaller, where ultimately you get down to the atomic level. And then you could build a machine that's only, you know, 100 atoms high, he said. And if you get it, you, you get it correct, then you could make other copies of that machine that would be exactly the same size, but it'd be exactly the same sort of arrangement of atoms. Basically, the idea is to make atomically precise machines that are exactly the same and operate exactly uh, the same way compared to each other. Um, and so what sort of scale am I talking about? Well, this is something I just threw together in Google SketchUp this morning. Basically, this is where, where I think start, things start to get interesting. Each one of these little balls represents an atom. An atom is about 0.1 nanometer across. A nanometer is 10 to the minus ninth meters. And if you stack 20 in this direction, 20 in that direction, 20 down, that is a 2 nanometer by 2 nanometer by 2 nanometer cube. You could, if you could build different molecules about that size, that's where they really start to become interesting, where they're big enough to have pockets in them where other molecules can go inside of them and, and be operated on by them. Where you can create channels through this that could selectively filter ions or water, and you can make purification systems that work at the theoretical limits of efficiency. Or you could create molecules that have patchy surfaces that could stick to other molecules like antibodies do, and you could cure every disease. All right, so the solution to all of our problems is down at this, su this size scale. And the, the challenge is building things on this size scale. Okay, so the master of this right now is nature. We are built out of molecular machines. They are atomically precise molecular machines, where every atom is in the right place and has spent four billion years evolving to get to the right place in space. And there are, so these things are proteins. They're long chains of amino acids. That's what this thread represents. It represents this chain of amino acids that then folds into a three-dimensional shape that does something. And this one here hydrolyzes, it reacts uh, organophosphorus compounds with water and detoxifies them. This has basically been evolved in the last hundred years by bacteria that are in our cornfields and they are trying to survive while they're constantly being inundated with organophosphorus pesticides, which are organophosphorus compounds are essentially nerve agents. The Department of Defense would very much like to figure out how to make things like this and uh, detoxify nerve agents. They're very worried, you know, chemical weapons. This is a model of an antibody. It's this big, well, it's this huge molecule, and it's got these little binding sites, one here and one here. There's two of them on the molecule, and they stick to everything you encounter in your life. You wouldn't last a week if you didn't have these things. Yes. Is there some significance to the color coding? Uh, they are, there's a heavy chain and a light chain. But what, what's in here are little atoms, little round atoms are in here. And uh, uh, this is a, yeah, sort of a cartoon. Uh, and the colors, I think, just represent the light chain and the heavy chain of the antibody. This whole thing is 150 kilodaltons. A drug molecule like aspirin is maybe 400 daltons. This thing is 150,000 daltons. Okay. So, uh, so aspirin is about the size of that pointer compared to this wow. molecule, okay, wow. just to give you a sense of scale. And then this is an aquaporin. This is a channel that only allows water through. It doesn't even allow protons, which are smaller than water. Uh, this is the, the thing that keeps your uh, kidneys working and keeps your cells from bursting from osmotic uh, uh, pressure. All of these things, if we could build things like this, we could, again, solve all of our problems. Okay, so what are some of the things I'd like to do? I'd like to be able to figure out how to do stuff like this to build, especially the molecules that speed up chemical reactions called enzymes, uh, because then we could do stuff like this. This is a molecule called methane monooxygenase. Okay, it's a huge molecule. 
It is 80 nanometers to the side, basically. It sits inside of a membrane of bacteria, and it takes methane, reacts it with oxygen and an electron source in NADPH, and generates methanol. Okay? If we could do this, if we could stick, you know, we're, we're, we're fracking these days and pulling up a lot of methane. Methane is a terrible greenhouse gas. Then we burn it for heat and we generate carbon dioxide. It's also a greenhouse gas. Not as bad, but um, uh, in a lot of far-flung places, we're generating a lot of methane and it's too expensive to, to liquefy it and ship it because methane is a gas. It's explosive. It's dangerous. But if we had catalysts that could rapidly mix it with oxygen and react it to form methanol, Methanol is a very conven convenient liquid fuel. It's very easy to ship that. There are, dozen, there are lots of people working on trying to uh, uh, solve this, trying to make molecules like this. Okay, you can't use this molecule because it is so fragile and so huge, and you basically need bacteria to make it and constantly maintain it and rebuild it. But if we could make things like this, then we could um, have it make a huge impact on, on energy. When you say fragile, do you mean unstable or? I'll, I'll show you. You okay. used to look at them the wrong way and they unfold. Okay. Is the idea. I know a little bit about this because I'm one of the first people to make a large unnatural protein. This is called DHP1. I designed the amino acid sequence. I synthesized the gene. I stuck it into bacteria. I expressed the protein, which means I made the bacteria make it for me. I isolated it, crystallized it, showed that it was well folded. It took me four years as a graduate student and the thing is a molecular boat anchor. It doesn't do anything, and I don't know how to make other ones. And I got really fed up with this, fold, this idea of folding molecules. <coughs> Basically, this is a long chain, like a charm bracelet of amino acids, and it has to fold into this four helix bundle structure. And uh, I got that to work and demonstrated that it works and published it as a paper, but I don't know how to make other ones. Now, people have made a lot of progress towards making unnatural proteins. I still think that's not how we're going to get there. Okay, and the reason is this. So proteins are amazing. They do everything in our bodies. They are our muscles. They make the channels in our membranes. They build everything in our bodies up from atoms and molecules. Um, they, you, you take some proteins, you hold them at 38 degrees for 35 days, and you make these wonderful functional things like eagles and us and trees. But you hold them at 70 degrees for a couple of minutes, and they turn into scrambled egg. <laughs> okay, they unfold. They're very, very, very fragile. And you just look at them the wrong way, and they unfold. Okay, they're delicious, but they're not very functional. So trying to design machines out of what is essentially jello is really hard. And I, I got fed up with it. So I took a cue from nature, and I said, well, why don't I build new building blocks that are easier to design with? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make some new building blocks. I'm going, to, I'm going to learn synthetic chemistry. I didn't know that at the time. I was a biologist, but I'm going to go and learn how organic chemists make molecules to make you know, medicines. So uh, I'm going to make my own building blocks, but I'm also going to take a cue from engineering, and I'm going to over-engineer the crap out of them. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make building blocks, and instead of having building blocks that couple through a single bond, and, and they, you make these very... Uh, floppy chains that have to fold in water, and they fold because they've got some greasy groups on them, and the greasy stuff wants to get out of the water and it packs into the center of the molecule. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make cyclic building blocks, rings, and I'm going to connect them together through pairs of bonds. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make ladder molecules. And if I synthesize, if I design a bunch of these different building blocks with different shapes, then they're going to be like little Lego bricks. They're going to snap together the same, do the same kind of chemistry. And when I, but when I put them together, I'm going to be able to program their shape. And I'm also going to hang a, a group, a tool, off of each one of them. So I'm going to be able to make these little sticks where I can program their shape and uh, control where the groups point hanging off of this little stick. Okay, so that's the start of the idea. What and did I didn't know originally, initially, what these are going to look like. I just kind of discovered uh, the chemistry that would let me put these things together. And it's the same kind of bonds that hold our proteins together. I'm just using two of them. And uh, I figured out how to design the building blocks and synthesize them over the course of a couple of years. And now these are the main building blocks that we use. Okay, so they're, the, 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 the corners here, the uh, vertices, are carbon atoms. They're not labeled, they're, they're carbon atoms. And they're connected to each other through chemical bonds. 
Yes. I'm sorry, what does program your shape mean at the chemical level? Uh, okay, so just like, okay, so you got this little brick here, and it connects to the next one through two bonds. So I can predict where this building block goes relative to this one because it's just a translation and rotation in space. But are they going to have an affinity to each other naturally? To uh, no, I'm bond? going to use organic synthesis to make very strong bonds between them. I see, okay. The same kind of bonds that hold everything, Great. everything together. Okay. And I'm a chemist now, so I know how to do that. Okay. I know how to take two molecules that are floating free and attach them to each other by just setting all the chemistry up properly. Okay. I don't have any of that stuff here because I figured it was... I'm happy to show it to you afterwards if you sure, want to sure. see yeah. how that okay. works. Yeah. But what happens is the way we synthesize these things is we will take a plastic resin and it's got one reactive site on it. It's got trillions of copies of it, but it's got a reactive atom on it. And then we'll take one of these building blocks and we will attach it to that bead. Then we'll take a protecting group off and we'll bring in another one and attach it to that. And then we'll take a protecting group off and bring in another one. So we link these guys, these guys together in a precise sequence. I know exactly what atoms I'm putting together here. Okay. I'm kind of limited. I can only use the building blocks that I have. And I can put them together in certain ways. But when you start putting them together in different combinations, the combinatorics just explodes. And that's what I wanted, is a lot of control over the shape by controlling the sequence of the building blocks. OK. So what are some of the things that we could do with this if we can develop this? We have developed. Well, each of these little red sticks is one of those little sticks. And what I've done here is I've tied it together on a little thread, on a little molecule called a peptoid here. So I'm displaying three of these little sticks on a peptoid. And they're kind of, they can kind of flop around, but the sticks are kind of stiff. And the idea is if I put two, three, four, or five of these onto one of these little threads, I can make a molecule that was bigger than the binding site of an antibody. It could wrap around a protein. Okay, and a lot of proteins that cause disease would be very useful to prevent them from talking to other proteins so I can make these sticky things that just stick to them and block and jam them. All right, so that's a whole new way of doing medicinal chemistry. Yes? Just for a sense of scale, how many of your building blocks are in your stick? Each one of these has got four building blocks in it. So just four. And I can put that together in a day. And I can make a, I, there are robots that can put 50 of these red things together in a day. Okay, so here's an antibody. This red and green thing is about just the size of this binding site here. Okay, it's much smaller than the antibody itself. But when you drape it across a protein, all the red here, it varies about as much surface area. And that's the important thing. To make things stick to each other, you have to get enough surface area buried between them. And they stick because there's greasy stuff on the surfaces, and water doesn't like oil greasy stuff, and so the greasy stuff sticks together. But you have kind of a checkerboard of greasy and water-loving stuff, and you have to make the right pattern to match the pattern of the protein you want to bind to. Nature is a master at this. You've got 12 billion of these antibodies floating around in your blood right now, and if you get infected with some new virus, within a couple of days, it will ramp up prediction of the one that binds that virus, and it will take it out, and you will live the end of the week. If you don't have that, you will die within two weeks. Okay? So this stuff is keeping us alive. The big thing I want to do is I want to make catalysts. So catalysts are molecules that are big enough. Each one of these little bricks, these are made in Google SketchUp. Each one of these little things is one of our building blocks. And the idea is to tie three, four, five, six of these things together to make little baskets, to make little pockets, where I can point groups in, into the interior and these groups, if I position them properly in three-dimensional space, I can make a thing called a catalyst. It's a molecule that speeds up a chemical reaction. And by speed up, I mean make the reaction go trillions of times faster. So like that methane monooxygenase. Methane in air does nothing unless you put a match to it, and then it does, goes boom. <laughs> but if you just mix methane in air, it will sit there for a 1,000 years and not do a thing. You throw in a catalyst and you can instantly turn it into, you know, within microseconds, turn it into a methanol. All right, a catalyst is something that speeds up a chemical reaction and isn't consumed itself. Um, yes? I just want to get clarification on sure, that. No, no, sure, um, no, please ask questions. So, kind of interactive thing. I've always um, thought of a catalyst at least in a biological contest as being something that, as you said, speeds up the reaction, but doesn't, are you implying that it can also initiate it? 
I know. All it does no, is it, it lowers just, the barrier between the starting materials and the product right, right. So it's and just it makes really, it happen okay, faster. Okay, okay. Like, molecules are, are sort of like valleys in this very mountainous space. Yeah. Chemistry is very promiscuous and things like to change all the time. But there are a lot of molecules which are very stable, like methane, okay? And it sits in its valley forever. But what, the, what a catalyst will do is essentially lower a valley between it and methanol and allow it to move oh, back and forth. All right. So that's what a catalyst does. And the catalyst itself doesn't be, isn't transformed by this process. And the valley in this case is a substrate or other molecules? No, no, it's really it's an energy surface okay, okay. which these things move around on. Oh, I see, got it. Got yeah. it. Okay. okay, so so this is an inside of, a, of the, uh, the catalyst uh, uh, called, um, um, uh, again, a phosphate organophosphate hydrolase. Okay, this is the inside of the enzyme that hydrolyzes organophosphorus pesticides. And it's got these two zinc atoms held by these imidazole groups, these histidine amino acids, and there's the organophosphorus compound. It fits into this little pocket here, and then uh, the zinc atoms activate water, will react with the phosphorus, and make the thing turn it, move it one step closer to what's in Coca-Cola, phosphoric acid. Right, detoxify it, basically. Um, what's not shown here is the huge sort of superstructure of the protein that holds everything in place. Because at 300 Kelvin, at room temperature, molecules are being pounded by thermal motions. And this thing barely holds itself together to create this pocket and organize these groups to carry out this transformation. If you heat it up a little bit, it unfolds, it dies, it stops working. The Department of Defense is putting enormous amount of work into making more stable versions of this enzyme so they can spray it on tanks and buildings and make huge quantities of it. But you spray an enzyme like this on a tank and in two minutes it's scrambled egg on your tank. It doesn't do anything anymore. All right, so they've got problems. They're, it's a difficult challenge. What I'm proposing to do is put things together that are much more chemically robust. We have to start from scratch and design the activity, but they're much more chemically robust at the end of the day and they would last for years decades, forever essentially, until we decided to take them apart. Here's another idea. So what we could do is make molecules that have channels through them. And if we design the channels properly, we could allow them to pass only certain metal atoms through them. All right, so the idea is we, we synthesize something that's got three of these little um, sticks in it. Looking from the top, here's one, two, three. And here they are sort of the side view. And we'd set it up so that we could take four of these guys and link them together and create a little bundle. And the channel would run down the center of that bundle. And if we set it up, now there's a lot of engineering that goes on here. And that's, this is what I'll get to the software. If we set it up so that there are greasy groups on the top, then if you spot this stuff onto water, it'll be like a detergent. And they'll form a, a monolayer on the, on the water. And if everything's designed properly, you could come in with sort of a paddle and close up, you know, push against the surface of the water and do what's called a langmuir blodgett film, where you pack all the molecules together at the surface, and if you set them up so they chemically react with each other and link up, then you could create a robust membrane that would have uh, very dense pores and no space between the molecules for anything to get through. And then what you would have would be a perfect membrane, a membrane that you could use to design it to filter lanthanides, you know, separate rare earth ions from each other so we could make it easier to get at the rare earths that make our phones and these super powerful magnets that we have now that allow us to make lightweight electric engines and enable Tesla and, um, you know, drones and things like that. Those are all made possible by these metals called rare earths. And rare earths aren't particularly rare. They're just insanely difficult to separate from each other because they have very similar properties. And even over the geological timescales of the planet, they have not separated from each other. And so we dig up these ores full of like 20 different lanthanides, and we go through insane amounts of chromatography in order to try and separate them out so we can use them for magnets and, and uh, other devices. Uh, a channel that would selectively allow neodymium through it would be game changing. Because you just set up an electrode on one side, and you set up, put a power supply across it, and you could uh, uh, reduce out the metal on, on this side, and basically filter, purify the metal out of a mixture. You know, pull gold out of seawater, and it wouldn't have to write grant proposals anymore. <laughs> okay, so let me show you some of this stuff that we have done, 
And this was all designed with software that I'm going to show you uh, and get to common list in just a second. So this is a molecule here that, that's, that's about two nanometers long. You can see it's got one, two, three, uh, three of our building blocks, and it's got three groups hanging off of it. And this whole molecule was designed to have a shape so that it plugs these green groups here. So they're all on one side of the molecule, and they can slot into the groove of this protein called MDM2. A lot of soft tissue cancers, the way that they allow the cells to continue to divide is they suppress a protein called P53. P53 is the policeman of the cell. And it's basically this yellow little helix is one part of P53. And the way that P53, the policeman of the cell, which normally would cause a cell to kill itself, commit suicide if it goes cancerous, the cancer cell suppresses that policeman by making more of this protein, this surface here, this colored surface, and uh, sticking to the yellow policeman P53 protein and taking it out. So if you make a molecule that jams into this groove and prevents the policeman from binding in there, then you can allow it to do its job and you can potentially treat cancer. Roche has been developing a molecule called Nutlin and it went into clinical trials and failed for a couple of reasons. Uh, mostly it's just not a very good drug. But um, when you bind a molecule into this groove, you can act, reactivate this policeman protein called P53. So we designed this molecule to mimic the P53 uh, little piece of the protein here. It presents something like a phenylalanine, something like a tryptophan, and something like a leucine. And it sticks into this groove uh, not quite as tight as the helix does, but almost as tight. And when we throw this compound, which we designed using software that, that I'll show you, uh, into uh, cells, it gets into cells, and it's got a green fluorescent group on it called fluorescein, it gets in there. And it stabilizes this protein called MDM2. So we published this a couple of years ago, but this is a molecule designed with software and built out of our building blocks. If you go and fiddle with the groups that it displays, you can change the binding affinity by quite a lot. And we can see binding by as we add here, as you add more and more protein, it starts to bind the compound. And the shape of this curve tells you how tightly it's binding. So by the, how that curve moves from compound to compound tells us what the affinity is. And if we take the three groups and we just replace them with this isobutyl group here, we basically knock out the binding. There is no binding. This is an atomically precise molecule. Okay, We know exactly what it looks like, and we know what that it's important to have exactly the right three groups presented exactly the right way, and then it binds the protein. If you don't do all that stuff, it doesn't bind the protein. All right, so we have a function that comes out of a molecule um, that, um, that we designed and synthesized. And you're saying the function really comes from the shape by the use of the control? It comes from a bunch of things. It comes from the shape of the, of the molecule. Okay, and there's some, one thing I haven't told you about here is, is that there's a thing called stereochemistry. Basically, this six, this ring, the six-membered ring, and this five-membered ring, they're like a plate. You know, they're they're made out of balls, atoms, but uh, all together they sort of form a plate. The next one is connected here through this single carbon, and it connects at basically a 90-degree angle. Okay, they're, they're perpendicular to each other. So I got these two plates, and there's these groups hanging off of them, but they're sticking perpendicular to each other. And the next one is again rotated 90 degrees. And by controlling uh, the arrangement of the groups around here, I can make these groups, I can move the group around in space by controlling the building blocks. Okay, here's another one that we made. This is a catalyst now. This, was, this is one of the catalysts, one of the three that we published, um, and it's all supported by uh, Department of Defense uh, funding. So the Department of Defense, I wrote a proposal and I said, I can figure, I, I'm gonna try, I wanna figure out how to do catalysis. Okay, I want to figure out how to speed up chemical reactions. So here we've got three of our building blocks, and we're presenting a pyridine, a base, an alcohol, and a urea in just the right constellation with the right stereochemistry, the right structure of the rings, everything pointing in the right direction. And when you get everything right, then you throw in methanol and vinyl trifluoroacetate, and this molecule will convert these into this stuff, methyl trifluoroacetate. Okay, it's not a very spectacular catalyst. It's it only speeds up the reaction about 2,500-fold for the first step and 150-fold the second step. 
There's two steps to the reaction. Uh, but if you change anything in this molecule, the activity drops. So what you're seeing here is the amount of product that's generated, and one is the maximum, as a function of time. And with the right molecule, within about you know, 60 minutes, within about an hour, you're essentially converted all the starting material to product. But if you mess up, if you change something about it, then it becomes a slower catalyst. And depending on how badly you change things, drastically you change things, it becomes a worse and worse catalyst. Okay, so we, we've got some confidence now that we can, based on these building blocks, we can design molecules. Yes. All right, I'm, I'm getting a sense from your presentation about how you're manipulating shape. One thing I'd like to understand is the tolerances, right? Because you're using a more rigid te technique. I assume there's some limits on how closely you can get the shape you want? Yes, because I'm limited by the building blocks that I have. I have four building blocks. I can turn them all backwards, so really it's eight. But I can put any functional groups hanging off of certain positions that I want, and these functional groups can move like this nitrogen. It can be here, or it can be there, or it can be there. And this alcohol can be here, here, or here. Same thing with the urea. And by putting the different groups, you, by all of this, there's actually an enormous number of possible molecules we can make here. This one is about as optimal as we can get with this size. So that's how we control shape. Are all limited by the tools you have? Yes. In terms of, oh, okay. Yes. We have to be able to put it together. And it has to be made out of these kind of building blocks. But there are more building blocks that we can use. And I'm going to show you how we can get to essentially universes of potential molecules, enormous control. Okay, but this is the sort of, it's, things aren't like on a rectangular grid here. It's these weird shaped building blocks and we have to work with them. And it, it actually presents quite a design challenge. Okay, so this is what this thing looks like. So here are one, two, three of our building blocks connected through the pairs of bonds. And we've got here is the pyridine hanging off of there. Here is the alcohol hanging off. And here is the urea. And this backbone can hold these three groups in place, but it doesn't really hold them in place. They flop around like crazy because they're being hammered by solvent. This is not in solid. This is always dissolved in a liquid. That's how we work with them. So they're constantly moving around very fast. Everything is. Everything made out of molecules and atoms is moving like crazy. So the challenge is to organize things so that they can work together. And that's what this molecule can do better than any other one that we make. Like if we flip this center, it takes this thing and flips it all the way to the other side. And it's gone. It can't do what it's supposed to do anymore. All right. All right, so but here's what we want to do going forward. So this is the stuff that we've been doing the last couple of years. This now I'm going to start showing you stuff of how we want to go forward. We're going to take these little segments. And we're going to tie them together like sausages, and then we can cross link them with additional bonds to create little bundles where everything's these sticks are tied together and they create pockets inside of them. And now you can bring functional groups from all over the place, and you can create pockets where things can go into and stick and be protected from the solvent. Now things start to get interesting. Now we start to make things that look like proteins. Okay, now we can start to build these sorts of pockets that could become catalysts. Okay, so you're all probably aware Moore's Law is kind of ending, right? Right now we're about here. We've got features that are like 14 nanometers. This is a bit of an old slide here. But if you keep projecting this down with time, here we get down to molecular sized things, and once you hit atoms, you can't build circuits smaller than an atom. Atoms are the bottom. They're the basement of our universe, the chemical universe. But um, there is another Moore's Law, inverse Moore's Law, that um, I was at the Department of Energy, the Department of Energy workshop last week, and um, uh, John Randall, who's the president of Zyvex, Zyvex is one of the first companies came up with, the, or with their mission to develop molecular nanotechnology. Um, he put up something like this where he proposed this idea of an inverse Moore's Law. And the idea is, if we, what we're going to do is we need to figure out how to make atomically precise structures. 
because there are certain arrangements of atoms that are very good at doing things like speeding up chemical reactions or generating conductive circuits or making transistors. And if we can figure out what those arrangement of atoms are and then manufacture lots of them, then we can create atomically precise devices that work at the theoretical limits of efficiency. It's sort of Richard Feynman's original view idea. Uh, Eric Drexler popularized a lot of this stuff and you know, they called it nanotechnology. Nanotechnology has become a bit of a debased word where it means basically anything that's nanometer scale. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about chunks, nanoparticles, nanotubes, graphene, or any of that stuff. I'm talking about things where we know where every atom is in space, where it's atomically precise, it's digital, and we know what the optimal arrangement of atoms are to create a particular property, like speed up a chemical reaction or bind a protein, and we make lots of it. That's atomically precise manufacturing. And that's a goal that we need to start working towards. We make medicines and drugs, and they're all atomically precise. But if we can make some things that are 10 times larger, then we can start this some, to develop some really new, amazing properties. And, and the idea of this inverse Moore's law is, as we go forward, we'll start to be able to make atomically precise things. We already can with chemistry here. But as we start to be able to make larger and larger atomically precise structures that do things like act as motors, or do logic switching, then we'll be able to do things like make factory, you know, catalysts, channels, medicines. This is where I want to work next. But above that, we could start to make assemblies of these things in factories that could build other nanoscale, atomically precise uh, products and drop the cost to essentially zero. Uh, higher up, you can have mechanical computers that work faster than electronic computers right now because moving molecules around, it, you can do that at extremely high frequency. And there are designs for mechanical computers that work faster and lower power than electronic ones. And then up here, sort of micron scale, you can start to build robots that could go into cells and fix things, right? Like I said, the solution to all of our problems, including aging and medicine, are in here. And this is where we need to go. I want to build things like this. Okay, this is a cartoon, fantasy, science fiction, Star Trek, but <laughs> physically it is possible. We're built out of things. All right, so I've developed this molecular Lego, sort of an instruction set for making functional molecules. And I want to make big molecules that work like proteins do. But I have a design problem. They're so big now that I can't design them the way chemists design molecules, which is basically with molecular modeling tinker toys. You've probably seen them in bookstores. <laughs> uh, I need an oracle. I need something where I can say, I have a certain function I need, like speed up a particular chemical reaction. And it tells me, okay, you'll need these atoms in space, you know, in this three-dimensional constellation. What I need is an oracle that can build a scaffold behind it that can hold everything in place. And if I make it out of my building blocks, the ones that we've de designed, I can synthesize it in a week. Okay, and the problem is I don't have this oracle yet. So and here's kind of how you could do this. Okay, how do you use computers to design molecules? Computers are probably the best chance of getting an oracle. Um, one way to design molecules is to take sort of the set of medium-sized molecules that could possibly be made, right? estimates anywhere from 10 to the 60th to 10 to the 160th, pretty big error bars there. And you take some small subset of those, like maybe 100,000 that uh, you could start with, and then design some, build models of them in a computer, design some computational filters and run them through the filters, try and come up with a small subset of molecules you could then hand to a chemist and say, here, this molecule will cure cancer, or this molecule will um, oxygenate methanol. Go make it. And then you have to convince them to spend a year or so of their lives making that molecule. I don't think that's a terribly efficient way to do it. We have done it with every molecule. The two molecules I've shown you so far, because they are relatively small, and they're all made out of building blocks that we know how to put together so we can Every one of the molecules that we put in the top here, we know how to synthesize. So there's no challenge of convincing a chemist to synthesize the thing. Um, they are all synthetically accessible. But to make these bigger molecules, like these guys, you need a different approach, because there are just too many of them. So the better approach is to use Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo is basically a, it's a very simple algorithm. You start with a random three-dimensional structure or sequence of a molecule. You calculate its shape. You predict how well it can organize the groups. Then you mutate it, you build its shape again, you predict again the properties. If 
You predict the property gets better, you keep that, and you keep going with that. If it gets worse, you roll a dice based on a thermal factor, and you decide to keep it or go back to the previous one. That's it. So it's just a random, uh, a random walk through sequence space, but the idea is most of the time it'll move towards an optimum property. And you don't have to, you can do this with irregular weird shaped building blocks like this. You just have to have a bunch of different ways of mutating it. And what we do is always mutate it in a way where we can still synthesize the thing. Using simulated annealing? Yeah. Simulated annealing is part of the energy scoring, at least part of the scoring function. Right. Um, now, screening works great if you've got a bunch of computers and you just want to ram them through, you know, have one computer do one screen, another computer do another screen, and then just pass them all into through. But Monte Carlo requires specialized software because you've got to get the mutation of the molecule, the building of the three-dimensional structure, and the scoring in a really tight loop. And computers, you know, they're great for video games, but they're really slow for molecules, for doing chemistry with. So everything's got to be as fast as it can be, as tight as it can be in one processor. You cannot live with communication lags between processors and stuff. It is an embarrassingly parallelizable problem because I can set up a million of these Monte Carlo searches all from different random starting points and let them try and find optimal solutions. All right? But it's also an open-ended problem. It could run forever. And if my scoring functions aren't good, then I'll get nonsense out of it. So I'm hoping our scoring function is good. But it really needs, I think, to solve this problem, you need a programming language. So I went off on a little side tour. My I am a programmer. I, since 12, I was 12. I've been, I, mean, I was one of those kids at Radio Shack playing on the TRS-80. My parents got me in TRS-80 when I was 12, and I've been programming ever since. Some people need to relax, some people read. I write code four, six, eight, ten hours a day. My wife will testify. So, and I've also been doing molecular modeling software for a long time. Before I started graduate school, I wrote LEAP, which is still being used 15 years later to build three-dimensional models of molecules. And so I decided to, the, 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 the software that I need doesn't exist. Um, I have a lot of C++ code, about 150,000 lines of C++ code that builds molecules and everything. But I do not want to write this code in C++, because it is a, it's a great language for writing fast, cache-aware software. It is not a great language for doing really high-level experimental things that you want to try one day and then throw it away and try something else the next day. I want to play with ideas here. And, and I already had all the C++ code to build the molecules, but tying it together and trying to do high-level things with it is a pain in the butt. So I first, I hooked the thing into Python. And I was using Boost Python. I exposed my C++ code to it, and it was a nightmare. It just, I just got so bogged down in it. Python is a beautiful, wonderful language for learning programming. It is not a good language for writing hundreds of thousands and million lines of code to build molecules with. Um, so a friend of mine, Mike Freed, who worked with Peter Norve, had been trying to convince me for 10 years to learn Lisp. And I said, well, that's that weird language with everything's uppercase and lots of parentheses. And, and, and it looks a little old and crafty for me. Um, but I was using XML to serialize my data. and I. And I kind of thought, you know what? If I just put an if statement and a loop statement, I could write my own little language here. And it looks kind of like the thing Mike was constantly telling me to try and learn. So I looked into it a little bit, and I wrote an archaic sort of interpreted Lisp that interoperated with my C++ code. And it was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Lisp is a wonderful language for molecules. <laughs> because Lisp is a language of lists and trees, and molecules are basically graphs of trees with some extra bonds in them. And it was so, it just fits so well together. Um, and then after, okay, so, so this is actually what it looked like. I dug this out a couple of days ago. This is my archaic list interpreter. And you can see there's stuff that starts to look like stuff you're used to, but there's a lot of horrible things in here. I had, it looks like kind of a hybrid of Python and Lisp, because that's what I knew at the time. <laughs> It's got single dispatch um, object oriented programming. There's a let star in there. Uh, set queue, you can only do one set queue per, per you know, instruction. Um, it's just weird and awful. And um, I was kind of spinning into this territory where I'm writing my own list. It's slow. 
never gonna, I'm gonna have to document it to get anybody to use it. Nobody's ever gonna use it. I need to do something standard. So I started looking at Scheme, started looking at Common Lisp. Scheme, I didn't understand continuations. I didn't have a clue how to implement a Scheme compiler. So I said, well, I'll go with Common Lisp. Common Lisp is mostly written in Common Lisp, right? So it'll just take me a couple of months to knock something out. Uh, and uh, uh, devil's in the details. It takes a little bit longer. <laughs> okay, so this is the archaic Lisp that I have. Um, so just to clear your palette, here are two pi a picture of two kittens to sort of clear away that horrible Lisp that I wrote there. <laughs> okay, everybody ready? Okay, so here's what I did. I wrote, I have a C++ code, and the problem with common Lisp was I, there was no common Lisp that would interoperate with C++. There are FFIs, and there was embedded or embedded common Lisp ECL, which can interoperate with C pretty well. But C++ is a very different language than C. All the stuff that people are using to write libraries and that I use, like classes and overloading and virtual functions and all that stuff, just makes the language more and more hostile to interoperating with other languages. Uh, so, I'm kind of getting out of the thing. Okay, at the time, also, there was this thing LLVM that was coming up. And it seemed to me like, that's a compiler back end. I could use that to, to um, sort of write the back end of the compiler. You know what, I'm gonna kind of go out of sequence here with, uh, because I'm already talking about this. So. All right, so I don't need to say why common Lisp. I'll thread that in as we go along. Um, but the big deal was how do I get my C++ code and other people's C++ code working with a common Lisp? I didn't want to spend the rest of my life writing a foreign function interface, okay? Because that's what I saw was missing with uh, common Lisp and C++ is hostile to interaction. So this is basically the problem. If you take some scripting language like Python or common Lisp, and you want to interoperate with some low-level libraries written in C or C++, you have to write a foreign function interface. You have to write wrapper classes, and you have to deal with the different memory models of the two languages. You have to deal with exception handling, callbacks, debugging. It's, it, it rapidly takes over your life. It becomes a, the interface becomes what you spend all your time doing. That's why Python was a nightmare to me, because I was putting so much work into just getting the interface to work. Things that don't involve molecules at all. I'm spending all my time dealing with memory management stuff. Because this is the way common Lisp interoperation works right now. If you've got some complex C++ library, you have to build a C wrapper around it, an interface, C interface, and then write a bunch of common Lisp foreign function interface code to talk to it. Okay? And that C interface becomes um, a problem. So what I knew at the time, I, I worked with Boost Python a lot. And Boost Python is a C++ template programming library that uh, builds an interface between C++ and Python. And it allows you to do this. Basically, it allows you to move the, the foreign function interface into the C++ code and let the compiler build all the interface functions for you at compile time. And then what I wanted was a common list that would talk directly to the C++ library through this uh, template programming um, interface. And the model is basically Boost Python. Uh, and Boost Python is the, is, is the um, you know, has now become essentially the de facto scripting language of science. Uh, all of my colleagues are using Python and it's largely because you can interface fairly complex C++ libraries with uh, it through Boost Python. Okay, so Boost Python is a C++ template programming uh, library. And if you haven't done C++ template programming, good for you. <laughs> this stuff is <clears throat> powerful, but very difficult to write and very difficult to read because it was never intended to be a language. It is a Turing complete language. It's accidentally Turing complete. C++ template programming <coughs> is to, is, is, is supposed to take the place sort of of, of of common list macros. But C++ template programming is to common list macros what IRS tax forms are to poetry. <laughs> because what it lets you do is you can write C++ code with little boxes where you can stick types into, and then it'll generate code at compile time. And to do the more complex sort of metaprogramming you need for this interface that I, that I developed, um, 
you have to write all this duplicated code that gets selected using pattern recognition by the compiler at compile time. And it turns out to be Turing complete, but it's really difficult to read. So what I've done now is I've developed a whole new implementation of Common Lisp that's got all this stuff built into it. It's called CLASP. It's about 150,000 lines of C++ code. It's, I, what I did is I took all the Common Lisp code from embedded Common Lisp, BCL, because that's based on C. It's built on a, on a C um, sort of core. And I thought, if, it, if that one's built on C, then all I need to do is write a C++ core that replaces all the C functionality, all. Um, and and it'll, it'll give me a, something like ECL, but uh, based on C++. I also wrote this library called CLBind, which is a lot of code borrowed from Boost Python. Um, that is a C++ template library that will expose C++ libraries to CLASP. So one of the first libraries I exposed was the LLVM C++ API. LLVM is a library written, developed at the University of Illinois. It's the back end of a compiler. It basically takes this, this sort of portable machine language called LLVMIR and automatically lowers it to native code for a bunch of different processors. So it'll do all the register assignment and all the memory <coughs> versus register um, optimizations, and it generates very fast code. And there's a new compiler that's come up in the last couple of years that Google is using uh, called Clang. Uh, it's a C++ C Objective-C compiler, and it's giving GCC a run for its money. All right? What's really nice about it is everything's a library. Everything's a C++ library. So you can get access to every part of the, uh, the code. I also exposed the Clang API. So Clang is the C++ compiler front end. The reason I did that is, I'll show you, it lets me do stuff, some really new exciting things. I've implemented tag pointers in class, so fixed nums, characters, single quotes all fit into 64-bit uh, pointers, and so um, this will allow me to do sort of generate performant code. And I've gotten class working to the point where it's a full common list with class with everything. And it runs ASDF, Slime, and Quick List, the triumvirate of sort of useful uh, parts of common list. Okay, so bootstrapping. All you need is Clang. All you need is a C++ compiler. It starts with an S expression walking interpreter, which is incredibly slow. It boots up just enough code to bring up, to load in the, my first compiler called B class. And B-Clasp is a bootstrapping compiler. It generates pretty slow code that's probably about 800 times slower than Steelbank Common List. But it does get class running. And once class is running, then I can load up Robert Strand. is a computer scientist at the University of um, Bordeaux. And he's developing a new Common List compiler called Cleaver, which is built, uses a lot of class, uses everything in Common List and he's putting all sorts of optimizations into this thing, and it is wonderful. Um, so that's, the, that's going to be the default compiler, C class. Cleaver running on top of class. And, and what I've done is basically just reuse all of B class to generate the, the LLVMIR, uh, but I'm, it's Cleaver that's doing the compilation of X, S expressions to um, an intermediate representation. And CLASP has a lot of similarities to ECL. I've replicated a lot of the functionality of ECL, including some of the implementation dependent details. So um, basically, if you've got a, uh, a library that depends on implementation dependent details, you can just convert the pound plus ECL sort of feature um, uh, flags to pound plus CLASP, and it'll just work. Okay, I did that with ASDF. Um, slime and Quick Lisp. Okay, so, so basically CLASP is to C++ and LLVM what armed bare common Lisp is to uh, Java and the, uh, the Java virtual machine. Um, it, CLASP does both JIT and ahead of time compilation without writing to files or anything. It's all done in memory by talking directly to the LLVM API. And uh, yeah, it's some new things you'll be able to do because everything that it generates is LLVM. IR will be able to do things like profile common list code with C++ code to, to um, basically profile code. 
Okay, uh, it also generates dwarf debugging information, so I debug it with LLDB and with GDB. Um, it supports two garbage collectors, okay? I use the BOEM garbage collector just to bootstrap it, but I'm also using the memory pool system by Ravenbrook, which was developed for, for Dillon and it's being used by Open Dillon. This is a very efficient compacting garbage collector, and I've set it up so that it compacts my 350 C++ classes. It moves them around in memory. And yes, I'm updating all the pointers to keep track of everything. That was a big job, which I did this one. So because I exposed Clang, a C++ compiler front end, to class common list, I, wrote a, I was able to write a common list pr program that does static analysis of C++ code. It loads the 170 plus C++ source files of CLASP. Because it's a C++ compiler front end, it knows C++, it loads it all in, and it looks through all of the, the abstract syntax tree and pulls out every class that needs to be garbage collected. Figures out where every pointer is in every class and builds 150 or now 180,000 lines of C++ code that is the interface between CLASP C++ and the memory pool system compacting garbage collection. Garbage collect. Okay, and all this stuff works. So it's, 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 a, it's a generational compacting garbage collector, and I don't have to do it other than, I, I just run this program, it takes about 12 hours on 16 cores to do the analysis, just run it overnight, and my program, all my C++ classes are garbage collected. So how often do you have to do that? Every time I add a new class, take out a class, or Add or change, add or remove a pointer, or change the name of a pointer. Of, of and it's not that often. I, I run it sometimes every day, sometimes every couple of weeks. But it's only need. I only need to do it for myself, myself, and then I distribute the C plus plus code that gets generated. Um, just out of curiosity, you mentioned Ravenbrook. Do you know if Nick Levine was involved in that? Uh, he was, he's no longer at Ravenbrook. Okay. I talked to him at ELS a couple of months ago. Okay, he's a good friend of mine. So now he's at Raven something else. Huh. But it's not associated with Ravenbrook. Okay. Um, class can also be extended. I can add more C++ code to it and those classes, there's two ways to do it. One is you can just expose naive libraries where you don't need the source code and uh, you can expose them to common list and add new functionality. That's what I do with LLVM and uh, the Clang library. I'm not moving LLVM or Clang objects around in memory. They're malloced in a normal way with new and delete. There's a more intimate way of putting classes into class where they do become garbage collected. And that's where my chemistry code comes in because I need my atoms, I need molecules, I need residues, I need all my chemistry objects, all 150 classes, also to be garbage collected. How am I doing for time? Is anybody? Oh, no. you're, you're one hour into the talk. You're fine. Okay, so I'm gonna I'll I'll wrap this up fairly quickly. Now, okay, so um, here's how you expose C++ library. This is my FFI. All right, so if I have some C++ function like add numbers, it returns a double takes two doubles as arguments. All I have to say is, in main, I just say def, give it the string, that's the name of the common list function. That becomes a symbol, and a pointer to the function, and it figures out, it writes, it generates at compile time an, an interface wrapper function that converts common list double floats into doubles, calls this function, gets the return value, converts it back into a double float, and away you go. Everything's fast because all of the underlying objects are all C++. So there isn't much of a, a, a much work to do here to do this, uh, the conversion when you call a function. So here's a quick example. Here is a C++ class of Vec2. It's got an X and Y uh, coordinate uh, doubles. It's, I've also got a dot product function in here that takes a, a uh, Vec2 by constant reference and it does the dot product and returns a double. Um, then here's a regular function that will take a, a string, C++ string, and a vec2, a constant reference, and 
print the result to C out. And then here's the interface. <coughs> okay, so you define the common list package VEC. You define a class VEC2. This is all C++ template programming. Here's the name of the class. It gets, it gets, there's a recipe to convert C++ names to common list. Basically, lowercase goes to uppercase, underscores become dashes, camel case, where the transition is between the lowercase and the uppercase, you get a dash put in there. Okay, so that's how names get converted. Um, you can define a constructor here. So it makes a function called make vec in common list that you give two doubles and it will return a vector object. And then, um, Expose the dot product method and expose the print vec function. Here's common list. You just load the compiled library in with load. So it's your friend's birthday. How do you, you find the perfect gift? Download the Amazon. You um, create a vec2 here, give it the two numbers, and it puts it into the dynamic variable A, puts another one in, in B. Oops. Then I want to print a vector. I just say you know, print the name and then the dynamic variable and then there's the output. Or I want to calculate the dot product, I just give it two of these vectors, and I get the dot product right there. Okay? So these C++ functions are now exposed to common list. So what are we going to do next? Well, make it fast. All right? The B class compiler that I got working last August, I guess a year ago, generates code that's about 800 times slower than steel bank common list. That is not acceptable. That was a dark day, I thought. It was done. Uh, but when I actually tried to load like ASTF, it took 15 minutes. Now it takes 14 seconds. Okay, but back then it took 15 minutes. That's where I contacted Robert and I said, can I please use your compiler? And I uh, spent the next, uh, this last year incorporating that and getting everything uh, working there. So now Cleaver is in there and what I need to do is use full Cleaver IR. There's a lot of stuff in Cleaver that I'm not using yet. Um, it, now I've got inlining working, and when I get inlining working, I generate performant code. Um, Robert is working on type inference right now. That will make the code even faster. Basically, it will figure out what types variables can be at runtime and do eliminate all the dead code and all the dead type checks, the unnecessary type checks. Once we do that and a couple more optimizations, this code is going to run as fast as steel bank common list C because it's generating the same kind of LLVMIR that Clang generates. You know, that's the common intermediate. If, once I start generating code that looks like Clang's code, it's gonna run as fast as Clang. Okay, a little bit of overhead for the garbage collector. Um, so, this is Robert Strand. We both get our hair cut by the same person, <laughs> Mother Nature. And he's at the University of Bordeaux and he's got decades of compiler writing experience behind him. He's developing Cycle, which is a new implementation of Common List. So it's sort of working on this slowly. It'll, it'll take him a, a while. Um, along the way, he's trying to invent new ways to improve Common List. And the part that I'm using is Cleaver, so his compiler. And Cleaver does this. It generates this kind of intermediate representation. And uh, uh, basically, it'll take Common List code. Cleaver will convert it into these, these uh, sort of intermediate representation, which is nicely displayed with uh, Robert's code and uh, GraphViz. And then CLASP takes this stuff and lowers it to LLVMIR. LLVM takes it the rest of the way to native code. And here's the result as of about three weeks ago. C class, this is Cleaver plus class. I've got a uh, demo uh, which basically is just an integer, a uh, little integer algorithm that calculates the 78th Fibonacci number 10 million times. Oops. And uh, B class, you know, my bootstrapping compiler it takes 839 seconds to do that calculation. C class takes four seconds. Steel bank common, or sorry, uh, here, here's the times, these are the relative rates, relative speeds. C++ and steel bank common list are at about the same speed. I don't want to really make any issue about the difference in, in speed here. Um, they're about the same. C class is only about four times slower. And then Python is about 100 times slower. This is the interpreted Python. And B class is about 800 times slower. That's just good enough to bootstrap the thing, but C class is going to be the default compiler. So in the last year, I've gotten speed improvement of about 220 fold. I'm sorry, what was B class? B class is the bootstrapping compiler of, oh, 
of class. I see, I see. And all it does is take S expressions straight to LLVMIR. Right. The designers of Common Lisp were brilliant. Yeah. They designed this language in a way that is really easy to, you can do that. Yeah. Without, and, and there's, no optimi there's no room for optimization in between. I thought LLVM would do it all, but you need to, you know, Common Lisp has variables on the stack or on the heap. And you, the compiler has to decide what goes on the stack and what goes on the heap. B class doesn't do that at all. It just puts everything on the heap. Everything's in activation frames on the heap. And that's why it's running so slowly. B class doesn't do any inlining. That's why it's so slow. So those are the two things that make it run fast. Escape analysis to figure out most of the variables can go on the stack. And then LLVMIR knows what to do with variables on the stack. The heap to LLVM is an afterthought. It's a malloc call. It's a library function. So that's, LLVM is good for writing C compilers. It's not good for writing languages with first order functions, closures. Okay, so I am a synthetic chemist trying to make molecules, trying to change the world with better molecules. Uh, I have taken a little side project here. I am so deep down the rabbit hole now. I've put four or five years of my life into developing this new common list implementation to support my chemistry code. I, flash some things up. Chemistry code basically sits on top of class. And it's running now. I go into ChemDraw, which is the tool chemists use to build molecules, draw molecules, for publications. I draw a molecule like this, and then I bring up slime. I load, I define my functions up here in one window. Here I'm writing uh, forms that actually do things. And here I see the output from CanDo. CanDo is the chemistry code running on top of class. Um, and then I just say scramble positions, it'll assign random coordinates, and here's a molecule that I drew. I don't have any three-dimensional structure yet. And I say build good geometry from random. And it takes that mess, applies nonlinear optimization, optimizes the bond lengths and angles and dihedrals, and in about a couple of seconds, it builds a three-dimensional structure. Sometimes it's wrong, especially because I've got all these rings. Sometimes they get rings concatenated with each other. So build good geometry from random, then checks the geometry to make sure there's no bad bonds and angles and stuff. And if there is, it throws it out and goes back to another one of these and does this again. And it just keeps doing that. So basically, there's pattern recognition in here. There's nonlinear optimization, there's math. There's opportunities here to take functions and then use um, maxima to automatically convert that into optimized code to do first and second derivatives of energy functions for the nonlinear optimization. All that stuff is what I've got planned with this system, and I'm kind of doing it with Mathematica now. Um, but that's basically what I've got. I've got this software called CanDo. It runs on top of a new common list compiler called CLASP. CLASP is a standalone uh, C++ or a common list implementation that works with C++. And you can um, download it on the internet, and it doesn't have any of the chemistry code in it. Right? it. And I would love Google to use it, for instance, for Google Flights. I'm trying to get it fast enough so they'd use it for that, and then maybe it'd help me uh, improve it and design it, uh, improve it, make it faster. Um, I've also got this hardware. We call them spirulina, these building blocks that let us make functional molecules. I'm trying to get all this stuff together to make the next generation of uh, Make things that will fix all of our problems, our material, real problems. You know, not selling advertising to each other, but really make molecules that that fix things. Yes. Yeah, hey, um, there's just one thing I'm a little confused about, and I, you, may, you may have mentioned this, and I missed it. But how does Robert's compiler compare to yours, and what's the relationship between CLASP and Robert's compiler? So CLASP is the overall common Lisp environment. Okay. Cleaver. Yeah. Is a bunch of C plus or a bunch of common Lisp code that I just load or compile file into class. Oh, I see. Okay. With, I, what it is is I compile B class, the bootstrapping class. Uh -huh. It's a common list, full common list. generates very slow code, right. 800 times slower than SBCL. Uh -huh. Into that I can load Cleaver. Cleaver hooks in to the compiler and takes over. It then becomes the default compiler. So compile and compile file, and then I'd go through Cleaver. I see. Cleaver is a much more sophisticated compiler. 
It takes S expressions to an abstract syntax tree, right. the abstract syntax tree to high intermediate representation, her, and then her to medium intermediate representation, mer, and that's what these things were. This is, this is her, this is mer, Okay. Because the little these uh, these uh, hexagons represent variables on the stack. It's done the escape analysis. It's done a bunch of optimizations. The solid line, the solid arrows represent the flow of execution. Uh -huh. The dotted ones represent the flow of data. Okay. I've become very good at reading these and debugging it. And, you know, I've found a couple of things to fix in, in Cleaver along the way. Mostly because I've got a running back in now and I can generate code and test Cleaver and so Robert and I are in a sort of a symbiotic relationship. He's yeah. developing Cleaver, I'm testing it, using it, torture testing it, yeah. running, you know, my test for it is to compile all of common lisp with it. Okay. All of my common lisp code. So then, once bclass runs, loads in Cleaver, then Cleaver compiles everything again. I see. So is it fair to say that you're using Robert's compiler to compile your compiler? Yes. Okay, got it. It's, got it. it's, yeah. it's, Sort okay. of like Inception, the movie, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it worked. It yeah. makes sense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, bootstrapping and yeah. bootstrapping on top of the bootstrapper, then yeah. bootstrapping again. There's three rounds of yeah. compilation to bring yeah. the system up. Right yeah. now, it takes about six hours. Yeah. So I'm rewriting B class right now to make it look more like, to look, take some of the things I've learned in the last year from Robert's compiler. I've gotten a crash course in compiler writing. I never took a course on compiler writing. Uh -huh. This is my first one. Um, yeah, and I pick common list, right? <laughs> I, don't, I don't take the easy road, that's for sure. Okay, so it runs on Mac OS X and Linux. It's an LGPL um, using the same licenses uh, ECL because I use a lot of ECL code. And we're actually going to regularize the two source trees. So, so we're going to use, we're, ECL and I are going to use the same common list code. Um, we're just going to put feature tests inside of it. It's on GitHub and I would love some help. If anybody who has copious amounts of free time and would like to <laughs> get their feet wet doing all sorts of stuff, C++, common Lisp, optimizing the compiler, there's a lot of things to, to improve. And up until now, it's been kind of a one-man show. Now it's a, well, Robert and I have sort of a loose collaboration, but it, it's a really, it's a great, it's great working with him. He's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Uh, and I've some, learned a lot. I'm sorry, do you use class heavily? Cleaver is, Lots and lots of class. Everything. The AST, the her, the her, it's all class. There's around methods. And man, I have learned so it is wonderful. I know Steel Bank Common Lift doesn't use class because of bootstrapping issues. Yeah. And my B class compiler doesn't use class because I don't have it when I'm booting it up. But Cleaver, Robert is writing that in the in pure common list using every feature available to yeah. the language. And because it's all written in class, I am able to hook into it like yeah. I have it's, never it's seen beautiful. before. <clears throat> it's beautiful. You know, you know what it is? It's it's almost like you can sort of take someone else's code and reuse it. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I've heard of it. I think it's called object yeah, see, programming. In, in, but in languages like Java and C plus plus, they talk about overriding methods, but in class, we talk about specializing methods. Specializing yeah. and writing and around method methods. combination is a beautiful thing. Yeah. It is amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm able to because because I've added new instructions and yeah. new AST. Yeah classes and stuff, and uh, you can hook into it so yeah, many ways, yeah. and I don't touch his code. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, this thing about sort of public and private symbols as well, so, so he'll, he'll not expose a symbol. I need that symbol. In C++, it's private, I can't touch it. Yeah, yeah. What's the point of that? <laughs> yeah, make it public and not public, but let me access yeah. it. I'm a programmer, I'm a big boy, I wear big pants, I can, I can deal with. Yeah you know, problems like that. So I just I just hook in with colon colon to the symbols and then I go to I email Robert. Robert, could you expose this this symbol to me? You know, make it public? And he'll either say, Oh sure, I should have done that anyway, or he'll say, No, that really should not be exposed. You should go use an around method. And then I'll write a around method and it works it's it's better. It's, it fits beautifully. Yeah. So there is a lot of generic function dispatch. Yeah. I have to make that go faster. Yeah. I'm right now I'm using ECLs. Robert has written a paper on how to do very fast mm -hmm. generic function dispatch, and we're going to implement that in, into, into uh, Cleaver and CLASP. Is that paper published yet? Yes, he published or that a couple of years ago. Okay. And I don't think any implementation uses it yet. I'm, I want to use it. Basically, compile the discrimination discriminator function. Mm -hmm. 
Great. So I've gone over time. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, wait, you're not actually over time, strictly speaking. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, we try and. Are we good or? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. Two things. Um, one about the structure of the bank, the other thing about the fees and fee rate. Yeah. Um, yeah, it makes sense to double bond so you don't have rotation, but why a single bond and then just loop around? Because then you get what's called a macro cycle, and those can, they can be highly organized. Yeah. And there are drugs like cyclosporin and uh, Taxol that are rings, big rings. But it doesn't freeze out the motions the way I need it to be. You, you get something that can roll, turn itself inside out, that can flop around a lot. Um, it's not like building something out of five and six membered rings. Five and six membered rings are kind of privileged in chemistry. They give you a lot of structure. Steroids are fused five and six membered rings. Um, there are marine toxins like pal, no, not palatoxin, but um, toxin. Anyway, there are these just long chains of rings, and they, because they're so organized, they are highly active and kill us in very small quantities. Um, yes, there was another. P53. Have you looked at PNC27? Whole, the whole website, pnc27.org or something like that. No, no. Uh, P53-MDM2 is sort of the hydrogen atom of protein-protein interactions. It's the first one anybody sort of goes to to sort of make a molecule that disrupts a protein-protein interaction, which is considered right now, and it is a hard problem. And it's going to be a distraction, but I think you know what. I'll, I'll, I'll take a look at it. I'll ask you about it um, right after that. But. Um, um, when I was a postdoc, I actually invented this other way of designing sort of structured molecules called peptide stapling, where you sort of have a helical peptide and you build a bridge across one or two turns to, to make a big ring, like you're saying. And those my, I invented this with Greg Verdine at the Harvard Chemistry Department when I was a postdoc. And this is now the basis of a company called Aileron up in Boston, who have got two molecules in clinical trial. and. Every year we get a check in the mail uh, from the patent royalties and maybe next year it'll be a big check if, if these things actually work out to be drugs. So I've got a lot of experience with macrocycles, rings made, and they're delicate, delicate things. Um, yeah. Well, I see that why the ring structure makes the, the backbone stable, but how do you compute the interactions between all the fluffy side chains? A couple of ways. You build lots of them and you minimize the energy to look for sort of the conf to sort of get an idea of the whole conformational space the molecule can occupy because they're constantly moving so they yeah. don't have one single structure so you have to generate them all and then you sort them based on their energy and the lower energy ones are where they spend most of their time you can also do this thing called molecular dynamics where you simulate the motion of the molecules at 300 kelvin for instance and then you run that for several nanoseconds. It takes many hours to run nanoseconds to the microseconds of time. But because these are ladder molecules, because they're fused rings, it takes much less time to generate every possible conformation, like a million times less time than it does for something like a peptide, a chain of amino acids of about the same length. Yeah. The other thing is, you're obviously living in a 64-bit world, which is something implementers haven't had the luxury of until real recently. Right, I got it in the right time. Okay, so um, because you're 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 using immediate uh, float 32s. Now, I'm wondering if you've considered using immediate float 64s and NAND boxing. I can't get NAND boxing to work. I can't. There, I, there just aren't enough. Um, the, the tagging approach that I used is kind of a like what Steel Bank Common Lisp uses and informed by Robert's experience. The zero bit, the first first bit is zero for fixed nums, yeah. and then everything's in the rest of the 63 bits. And then if you have a one in there, then it becomes either a cons cell or a general pointer. And the, I, I use a cons cell instead of a list like steel bank common list uses it to denote a list, which can be a cons or nil. Mm -hmm. I'm using it just for a cons cell so that cons p will be fast. Mm -hmm. Cons p is just a <coughs> test of that okay. bit. Yes. Yes. Robert recommended this. I've now inlined cons p 
and yeah, it is very. Yeah, I'm just honest. just wondering if you weren't getting killed by boxing and boxing 64-bit clubs. So with Cleaver, I will not be, because Robert has box arithmetic and unbox. He has boxing. He has unboxed arithmetic uh -huh. instructions, and what's going to happen is the the her that gets generated is going to have you know unbox, do an ar arithmetic operation, box. Unbox, arithmetic, box. Whenever there's a box and an unbox right after each other, you can throw yeah, it out. Yeah, sure. So basically, you're going to your code is going to there's going to be a front of boxing and unboxing that will move outwards in math heavy code, and all of the work is going to be done with unboxed, fixed, uh, unboxed doubles, unboxed floats, and all you're going to have to pay is the cost of boxing at the start and the end. And we might be yeah, able to get that. If you're aggressively inlining, then that's reasonable. If you're in inlining, that becomes very reasonable. So I think the overhead is going to be very small. Yeah, because that's certainly what 32-bit environments have suffered from for a long time, especially in Scheme, where 64 bits is kind of the de facto default. You right. know, there's box, unbox, unbox, box. So box, 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 uh, so so the um, the what was the thing you called? You said it was NAND boxing. NAND boxing. So NAND boxing, a, a double 64-bit IEEE double uses every bit, but there's the the Exponent there, which you can set to zero, and then you get 54 bits of stuff to play with. Yeah. I can't turn that into a tagging scheme that does the other stuff that I need. Cons p. Well, why not? I mean, you, sure. you, you, what you're putting there is a pointer. Okay, but a pointer has this, the, the, a pointer in a 64-bit machine. The low 300 bits are. You know what we should do? We should yeah. sit down yeah, and, and work yeah. through it. But I, yeah. Robert and I and a couple of people on pound list and pound mm -hmm. class. Couldn't get it to work on Freenode, by the way. Yeah, okay. Yeah, there just aren't enough bits. I need a 65th bit. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Um, just a general question with your background. You said you started as a uh, biology like PhD and then decided to move into chemistry because that's what you. My undergraduate work is in chemistry. Uh, I, so it started in computer science. Three semesters of computer science, great GPA going because <laughs> they didn't pay attention. I, I just didn't know how to study. Took a year off writing cash register software on TRS 80s. Decided I do not want to work for people in my life. I read a lot of science fiction. I want to build molecular machines. Decided I was going to learn genetic engineering, and if I couldn't, and I figured I'd need to learn chemistry to do that. So I was going to go back to school and learn chemistry. And if I couldn't hack it, I was going to learn business and hire people to do this for me. But I want to build molecular machines. I want to cure death. Okay. It turned out I was actually pretty good at science. Um, I went back, I took general chemistry in the lab, and all I did was work through problems in the back of the book. I got my first A pluses. I got my first, ex, you know, perfect scores on exams. From then on, I was able to take a course load, and I just had to work my ass off to learn. Because I'm not terribly bright. I just work hard, and I focus. And that was my, my, my strength at the time. So I learned chemistry got a degree, worked for a year writing molecular modeling software for Peter Coleman for Amber. Then I started graduate school and I decided I was going to do protein design. Forgot ever, all the chemistry that I'd learned, making, working with bacteria and stuff. Then I said, proteins are not the way I'm going to get to this. There's a theme here, you can see. Um, well, first I started computational chemistry, but I realized computers were too slow. And I wasn't going to get to it that way. So I went into protein design, protein engineering realized proteins weren't going to get me there, so I decided to change. Went into chemistry for my postdoc, relearned chemistry as a postdoc, sitting in the library for three hours a day working through physical chemistry, organic books. Learned chemistry again, invented these stapled peptides, which are now the basis of a company up in Boston, and then became an independent uh, professor, with always with this idea, and when I became independent, I figured out how to make these things work to the extent that you saw. Uh, did I answer the question, or did I go horribly into reminiscing? That was good. Okay, that was my that's my background in a nutshell. Uh, yes. Now this might be a comment which might be better for discussion afterwards, but you know, I just think when you're mentioning about Lisp and you know how it reminded you of chemistry, the one which just makes me think of things like um, Wagner and Dare's idea of. People talk about their artificial lambda chemistry. I don't know if you've run across that. I've, I've seen that, but I, I, I can't get 
terribly excited about it because all I can see in my mind's eye is molecules, real molecules, and I deal with those every day. So if it's not those, life is hard enough with those without. <laughs> Well, well, I think the idea there is that since life is hard enough with those, it's more in the spirit of let's find some other system that's a little simpler but has some of the basic properties, then we can ask how that works. Right, and I've seen them. Build and, up life or whatever. Okay, I'm going to make it. Yep, and, um, but, but I really want to build real, real so, molecules, so, real so, things, so, and so that's what I focus no, on. I'll talk to you. Of course. Um, I, I've learned, I've programmed in a lot of languages, including like small talk, prologue. I did a lot of prologue programming, picked that up just for fun. Yeah. Turns out that's very useful for doing pattern recognition yeah. and sure. the thing in here called type assignment. Because yeah. there's more than one type of carbon in molecular modeling, there's like 20 of them. You got to recognize them, and prologue turns out to be a great way to do that. So there's a sort of a s prologue interpreter built into. Clasp yeah. that does that. It's I mean, right now. It's written in C plus plus. Prolog and Lisp both together very nice. Yeah. Um, yes, and then. Can you talk about this uh, MCMC algorithm? I mean, is it written in Clasp or is it written in C plus plus with a binding to Clasp? It's going to be written in Common Lisp. It's going to be written in Clasp, but it's not written right. I mean, it's written in that archaic. There is a Monte Carlo in there, and I'm just going to translate it. But the Monte Carlo code is like this bit. It's the stuff that it calls that. Is everything underneath? So, it. like, you have this, this. You're optimizing with respect to some objective function. Yes. And so, is it, I'm just trying to understand how this is not, or, or how this involves like all these, this way you've embedded chemistry in Lisp. So, does this objective function like uh, express like the, the the types you were just talking about, the chemical types? Yes. So, this is one of the objective functions. This is okay. the one that people use to model big molecules. It's called molecular mechanics. Molecules are treated like balls connected by springs. And the bonds are treated like, in this case, like Hooke's law springs, where there's a restoring force. You've got a force constant for a bond that defines how tight it is. You've got an optimal length here. And then you've got the current length, which is a function of the xyz coordinates of two atoms, so six coordinates. You take the difference, you square it, multiply it by the force constant, and you've got the energy of one bond. Now a molecule can have a thousand of them, so you sum them all up. You do the same thing for angles. There's a funny function here for torsions, which is where you've got four atoms rotate around a central bond. And then you've got electrostatics here. All right, sorry, non-bond and electrostatics. Okay, this is like Newton's law of gravitation here, but for electrostatics. Gauss's law, I guess. It's been a while. And then I've got a bunch of restraints. So I've got things like chiral centers that I need to keep, a particular chirality. A lot of force fields don't have forces built into them to, restri to, to uh, restrain these things. So here's what I do. So there, Amber and all these molecular mechanics programs that do this, they calculate this energy, but they also need the first derivative. And for some calculations, you need the second derivative, the analytical second derivative. I don't have time to, to write the code to evaluate and debug a first and second derivative second derivative calculator. They're very complex if you're going to make them fast. So here's what I did. I wrote a program to do it for me. I wrote it in Mathematica originally. This is my first introduction to metaprogramming. I wrote a mathematical program that you give it a function like this, and then you, calc you tell Mathematica to generate the first and second derivatives. It generates these horrible, complicated, absolutely useless for calculations um, expressions. And then I went in, because it's, they're all trees, Mathematica really should have been Lisp. Yeah. Uh, OK. I think it was originally written in Lisp. Wolfram, uh, well, <laughs> um, anyway. Um, OK, so but, but they, these are basically expressions, which I can write code in Mathematica to dig into. And so that's what I did. It goes in and pulls out common sub-expressions, like y2 minus y1. You'll see it's all over the place here. It, it pulls it out, sticks in a temporary variable, and then generates code, which is just the calculation of each of these temporary variables. It's, single, it's static single assignment uh, code that it generates from this. And currently, it's expressed as C code. So it generates optimal C code, or near optimal C code, for calculating the function, its first derivative, and its second derivative. So it's a program that writes a program. Then this is compiled into class. This is what does the, the scoring function. 
It's very fast. I've timed it against code written by dozens of chemistry postdocs in Amber, and it runs at about 110% of the speed. So they're a little bit faster than me. Once I actually turn this into LLVMIR, it's going to scream. Um, this is one representation that I came up for uh, with it. Okay, here are the inputs, x, y, the three, x, the three x, y, z coordinates. And there's um, some force constants somewhere in here. Uh, green operations are multiplication. Blue is addition. Red are the expense of reciprocal and square root functions, which the program tries to minimize. And then you feed the inputs through and out from the, the function, the first and the first and the second derivative uh, components. And then that uh, is what I'm doing right now. What I'm going to do is convert that into maxima of common list, run it in clasp, and you'll be able to type in just an energy function and it'll generate all the code to rapidly calculate the first and second derivative. Do you want to look at the automatic differentiation? This is automatic differentiation and actually working. Exactly what it is. I didn't know what I was doing at the time, but that's what I've, I've written here. Via Mathematica. Via Mathematica. It is horrible looking code. <laughs> <laughs> okay. A wolf of language. Um, okay. Yeah. That's. Uh, and so it does the. So it's what generates all these things from this. Uh, it's doing nonlinear optimization. So it's using steepest descent conjugate gradients, and then this algorithm called the truncated Newton method, which uses conjugate gradients to approximate the Hessian, the second derivative. And once you get close to the minimum, it starts doubling the number of correct uh, significant figures every step. Is this Hamilton uh, No, not quite. It's just nonlinear optimization mm. and using this truncated Newton refs and method. Mm. Right. And it screams. Uh, and the steepest descent of conjugate grain have a problem that they'll go very f quickly initially, but then they just take forever to converge. Right. And, and you're spending hours waiting for chunk, 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 yeah, chunk, yeah. chunk to convert. Once the truncated Newton, um, oh, I think I've got a. Yeah, here's, here's, here's the energy, and this is the end of it. The truncated Newton, the min T and HP uh, algorithm has kicked on. And here's the energy. It's going to go to zero. And once you start to really converge, you'll see that the number of zeros in the answer, um, you get an extra order of magnitude closer to the solution with every uh -huh. two or three steps. And then just bam, convergence. So this is one of the fastest energy minimizers available, built into class. I just implemented reading papers and um, coding it up. Yes. Yeah. So um, when you told me, since you you have small talk background, when you told me when you told us that the, um, the, the that loading quickos for the first time took you 15 minutes with the B class compiler, I immediately thought of the first um, the first non Xerox uh, small talk system when they they published the image and said go write your own interpreters. So they wrote a, a very vanilla interpreter. It took eight hours to uh, half tone the initial script small talk screen, turn every other dot on basically. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's what I don't feel bad about 15 minutes. I, but still, yeah. Um, my problem is I need to run this on supercomputers. The archaic Lisp ran on 40,000 CPUs. The Lisp interpreter it ran on Kraken, which has been decommissioned now. But it was a machine on the NSF, the National Science Foundation Terra Group. It was wonderful, and all the, the molecules I showed you, the two of them were designed on that system. Um, I get two hours of 40,000 CPUs. If it spends 15 minutes just booting up, <laughs> you know, there's that much less time yeah. to deal with. Embarrassingly serial booting up. Yeah, yeah, because every one of them, all 40,000 CPUs are sitting there for 15 minutes loading an SDF. No. Right. It's got to be faster than that. Yes? So um, I have a slightly off-topic question for you, but I'm pretty sure you mentioned the term immortality. And yeah. uh, I was wondering what your Am views I still were. Recorded? I was wondering what your views were on transhumanism, and if you're familiar with Aubrey de Grey's work, and do you think that's actually going anywhere? I I don't know what his work is. Okay. I know of him. Uh -huh. I think um, 
I think it's kind of like space travel. We really need to develop this technology before we're really going to be able to solve problems. Uh -huh. Because aging, I think, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't study aging at all. I've never read a paper on it or anything. Um, I hear a lot of stuff that, right. you know, you got chemical cross-links that in your skin is basically the malleable reaction, the reaction that we use when we're cooking. It's happening over 80 years. Your skin is, you're getting all this cross-linking between proteins in the extracellular matrix and those proteins in cell me membrane, proteins in the cell membrane, and that that's what causes wrinkles. Well, the only way you're going to fix that is if you go in with a catalyst that's small enough to get into that tangled mess and start taking those bonds back apart again. I don't care what anybody is doing. There is no way to get into a chemical matrix like that unless you have a small catalyst that can reverse the bonds. And that's what you're working on. I could build that. Right. Okay. I don't know what it's going to look, look like. like yeah. I don't have a cure for aging right <laughs> yeah, now. Yeah. But, but give me the money, give me the time, yeah. and I think we could find catalysts. Like, I know in the universe of catalysts that I could build, there are some in there that do that. It's finding them. It's designing them. Um, but I don't know if that's going to cure aging or kill you horribly. Right. If you take that thing. Okay, you if it does cure people. aging, it isn't going to be anybody in this room that gets to use that. I, I got hopes and dreams. That's right. That's right. You gotta. You gotta think big. Right? You know, I keep my head in the sky basically, but I keep my feet on the ground. I, I teach organic chemistry. I teach what's possible and what can be done now. Yeah. And I'm uh, try and span that gap there, but you know. Get a couple of beers in me, and I'll tell you all my, everything I think about it. And I think it's it's important that we solve those problems, and along the way that we solve every other problem, because a whole bunch of 200-year-old geriatric people running around consuming resources the way we do now and filling up landfills is not going to be good. Right. We need the resources to take all that stuff apart and put it back together the way we need right. and recycle it atom by atom. We cannot keep putting stuff into landfills. We cannot keep pumping carbon dioxide into the air. Right now, we have no way of dealing with that stuff at all. These molecules could take carbon dioxide, sunlight, water, knit it back into hydrocarbons so we can pump it back down into the ground where it belongs. Where it came from. Where it came from, right. Yes? DNA is a kind of machine that's pretty specific. It replicates. Um, have you looked into building other types of self-replicating molecular machines? Or is, is there something special about DNA that you know, makes it so DNA, as far as I know right now, there are no DNAs that replicate themselves. It's the proteins that they express, those machines, are able to copy DNA. So the, um, the you know, RNA polymerases, the DNA polymerases, those are proteins like the things I showed you. And the, the, the reason, I, you know, there's this hypothesis that there was this RNA world where everything living was made out of RNA and there was no proteins at the time. Um, DNA and RNA are very chemically, they're much more simple than proteins. They have far fewer sort of functional groups, tools that can do things, and they're bigger. So they, they, they can't get down to the atomic level. They can get sort of like an order of magnitude higher. And you can make one cool things, like, you know, this thing called DNA origami, where this guy figured out, um, Paul Rothman figured out how to take a virus genome throw, design a whole bunch of short little oligonucleotides that you can order on the internet and mix them all together and it'll make DNA happy faces. And I, I had dinner with Paul Rothman last week at this Department of Energy thing. He's not doing that kind of stuff anymore, but there are hundreds of people that are doing it. It makes cool stuff, cool looking stuff, but it's still 10 times too big for me. It's, it's, not, it's too big, too diffuse, too soft to do catalysis the way I want to do it like enzymes do. It's almost like, you know, it's like trying to build a watch with oven mitts on. Um, the DNA is just too big and too soft. It's my opinion. Other people are doing a lot of cool things with it, getting way more resources and funding than I have. But the scale that I'm working at with our building blocks is about the same scale as proteins. Proteins can do amazing catalysis that DNA and RNA can't even touch. And every enzyme in the world in nature is a protein. Yes? What's your agenda going forward? Once you get class working, 
Where do you go from there? It's to start designing molecules. Uh, so CLASP <coughs> is, so I got a bunch of agendas here. The main one is to start designing molecules that are two, three of our segments tied together. Because we're working on, I've got students trying to make glucose sensors, I've got students trying to make channels, I've got students trying to make metalloenzyme-based mimics. Metalloenzyme mimics of catalysts with metals in them. I've got, I've got a bunch of projects going, and I don't know what molecules to tell them to make. And they can't design them because no one can design them, but they're our little squishy brains. You need computers, or you need to make millions and billions of them and throw them at a problem to see if they stick. We're working on that as well, called combinatorial chemistry. Um, so so I generally to tech. design some molecules. Yep. CLASP is your tech. CLASP is my tech yeah. technology to... It's no, no, it's, it's your TEX. Your, uh, I mean, Don Knuth was writing books on uh, computer science. Yeah. He, wrote, <laughs> yeah. he didn't like the typography. Or, or he Richard Stallman's Emacs. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. And actually, yeah, I mean, Emacs to me is sort of the epitome of what I'm trying to achieve here. It's a, it's a system that thousands of people have contributed to. And I think the, real, the reason why you can, so many people can work side by side in that program is one feature, dynamic variables. Yeah. Right? Because you can set variables and then they work with, within the dynamically within the context of the functions that you call, and then you come out and now you can set them to something else. So you can, um, that's something I want to use here as well, is to be able to configure calculations and then um, configure them a different way and run them again, and I don't have global variables that I have to worry about. There's, there's another package that kind of does what I do for proteins, it's called Rosetta, and it's written, it's about two million lines of C++ code. And it is a complicated beast to work with, and people are having trouble with it because you know, every couple of months they come out with a new version, they tinker with global variables and constants and stuff, and the behavior changes. And I think that's something we can, we can avoid. But, but yeah, CLASP is my tech, it's my Emacs. It is the, the sort of language that I'll build everything on top of, straining the analogy. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think it even goes beyond just dynamic variables, it's the ability mm -hmm. to have do metaprogramming, right? To write, you know, macros of the form with dash, you know, passing a body of code in a particular context, yeah. evaluate it. Yeah. yeah, there's a there's a there's a bunch of things about list that make it much more powerful for doing complex, high level, yeah. multi developer program. And I'm hoping I can bring chemists to this. I don't know. They're pretty tied to their Fortran and Python these days. <laughs> I'm at, but, but I'm also toying with the idea, not even toying, I'll probably do this. I'll probably just expose the whole thing in Python as well. Yeah. So yeah. I can write common lisp underneath and it'll all be exposed to Python so they can do their Python and feel that they're doing something useful there. I don't know how much you're, what you're doing relates to the field of bioinformatics, but I do know that there's a lot of people in bioinformatics that were doing stuff in, in this field. Yes, so at Stanford Research Institute. So yes, I know Peter Carper. Uh, Marcus uh, Fermanacker okay. is, is working, writing common list code for bioinformatics. Yeah, sure. There's there's a lot of things that are used there. There's also R. Yeah. Like one of my friends, Boston, has uh, just got a PhD in bioinformatics, and she exclusively programs in R. Yeah, I mean, one of the big problems with R and Python, though, is that they're not really scalable. You know, as soon as I say something like that, somebody will jump down my throat okay. and tell me there's compilers. Or yeah. R isn't, isn't scalable. Yeah. Python. Uh, Python. R, isn't R I know. I've been reading and, yeah. and you know, yeah. I actually contacted the developer of R because he wrote some things about five years ago saying they should develop a whole new statistical programming language based on common list. It was, it, I think that if you Google I H A K A I H A K A and uh, it says, says to R, get drop dead, or something like that. <laughs> You'll find um, this paper that he wrote, uh, because R is not scalable. Yeah. Um, there's a guy who's been working on a compiler for a couple of years, and he's gotten like a five-fold improvement in speed. Yeah. And R runs at about the same speed as Python, or slower. Yeah. But they have a lot of C code underneath it, and you call these vector, these, they call them vector functions. Yeah. Yeah. You call the C code, it's basically like my archaic common, the, my archaic lisp. Yeah, it works the same way. C-Python implementations. Our operating principle is do everything as stupidly as possible. It really is. Yeah, I, I, 
don't like to rag on other people's yeah, yeah. stuff. It's yeah, dangerous. but that isn't Python language. That's just C Python. It's it's a different Python as well. I mean, even yeah. even uh, Ross Russell, uh, Guido, yeah. the guy who yeah. developed yeah, Python, the Python yeah. Yeah. he works at Dropbox. Right. They're using Python 2.7. They're not compiling yeah. it or anything. They're using Python 2.7 at Dropbox. Yeah. Huge amounts of code. Yeah. Dropbox is written in Python 2.7. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and he's, they're up to Python 3.5 and nobody wants to, or the scientific community is not moving to it. Yeah, no because the is. libraries haven't caught up yet. The yeah. libraries haven't caught up. That was my problem as yeah, well. Yeah, I'm yeah, using yeah. a half yeah. a dozen Python libraries. Some yeah. of them, yeah. I, I, I make the move to 3.0 and I realize three of my libraries have not been yeah, updated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what broke the camera. Yeah, most people are still in version 2.7. Well, yeah. what the key yeah. libraries that the so whole NumPy stack is, 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 has moved. The, it's num available. Uh, the NumPy yeah. stack is good. NumPy stack. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Now, they have some good stuff here. They have some I just, good stuff, I just and all my colleagues are using it like crazy. Yeah. I mean, I do a lot of machine learning work, and I just found that the Python stuff didn't scale. I went to an ML a machine learning meetup talk where there's actually a guy in New York developing a Spark-like framework for Python. Um, so that you could do distributed ML and Python. Well, I was using Open and MPI bindings for mm -hmm. Python, and I had trouble with those. Yeah. It's, oh, the pain. It's just, it's just a mess. It's, it's a bit of a mess. Um, Common Lisp is a ANSI standard. Yes. Yep. There's all these libraries that if I write things properly, I can yeah. use them all. Yeah. I'm using Slime ASDF. Yeah. Quick Lisp yeah. took me yeah. took me a day to get Quis Quick Lisp up yeah. and running. Yeah. And uh, there's a, a lot of friendly people on the internet in Pound Lisp on Freenode that yep. give me advice. And it's a real language, tried and true. Yep. Google Flight products are written in it. Yep. And its best expressions are wonderful. Yep. I, mean, I love yep. parentheses. I mm -hmm. understand the reader. Yep. I love everything about it. Yep. It's got some weird things in it, but it's as close to an ideal language as there yep. is. Absolutely. I really don't care what it's written in, as long as I can express what I need to express. Yeah. And I just didn't see it in other languages. Yeah. Um, I mean, one thing that it also has that I don't think a lot of other languages has is that it was people actually sat down and designed the language. You know, it's really, and, and really well years and years of meetings and committees and all this stuff to yeah. you know, proposals and drafts. And, they were, and this was done by really smart people too. You it, know? And, and just really, really well thought out. I, yeah. I, I can't point to a single instance, but as I've, I mean, the commonless hyperspec is burned into the back of my head. Yeah. <laughs> um, there are things that, I, I, what I learned was that, okay, I may not understand what they're trying to do right now, but just do what they say. Yeah. Because it will become clear why it's done that way. Yeah. You know, and, and things like path names, as, as much as people rag on path yeah. names, not having them, it makes your life so miserable it when does. you're trying to yep. work with, with doing the stuff I'm yeah, trying yeah. to do. So I load up can do, I load up Clasp, and I have this whole directory hierarchy that I can access with logical path names, you know, sys colon and chem colon, yeah. and yeah. all the code is there, all the objects and stuff I have that are there. All I have to do is set up the logical path name translations. Yeah. Um, it's just all wonderful. Yeah. It's really well thought out. I mean, the Python libraries are great as well. Yeah, yeah. There's a Python library for everything, and they're all yeah. there when you load it up. That's one of its great strengths. One of the things I like like about it. And some of the scraping code that's in the can-do build system is written in Python, um, because you can't write a complex C++ program without doing some metaprogramming. It goes beyond the template programming thing. You always have to scrape for some. So I scrape out symbols, and I scrape out classes. Python code. I don't want to write a lot of Python. Yes? How do students take to all the lists? I mean, they, they haven't yet. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't yet. Um, I haven't given it to them yet. I mean, I was able to build molecules two weeks ago for the first time in five years. That's when I started digging out that old, the old code. So my students haven't. I've got one student who's done some programming. Basically, self-taught, learned how to use Python to do docking and stuff with molecules. Um, what I'm probably going to do is I'm going to drop this whole thing into Python, expose everything automatically from Common Lisp to Python, and then they'll be able to write their stuff in Python. 
and the adventurous ones can go down and write stuff in Common Lisp. That's, that's my plan, and I think it should be pretty easy because if, see, Common Lisp has a lot of introspection. Has there been any press coverage in the Temple News or UPenn or anything else? Uh, no, Temple, I have not. I, they missed the first round when I told them. <laughs> Second time I do, the, the next release I do, which will have C-Clasp and Cleaver in it, which is coming in a couple of weeks. I could stop, I've been doing a lot of traveling and grant proposal writing. Um, but it, it, it did, uh, you know, I, I'm on Hacker News front page every couple of weeks or something. Hmm. Um, I posted the first one, but since then I just do stuff and people post it on Hacker News. And the Reddit, uh, programming and Reddit Lisp chat rooms, that's pretty much it. So, but it's, a, you know, it's a pretty small community, Common Lisp, but there's a lot of people who seem to want Common Lisp that interoperates with C++. Yeah. I don't know if you guys know yeah. a guy Stasatz. He's, he's, a, he's a guy in Eastern Europe. He's one of the maintainers of Common Lisp. And, um, of which implementation? Still bad Common Lisp. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, Slime, he's one of the maintainers yeah, yeah, yeah. of Slime. He's brilliant. Yep. Um, and uh, he's been helping me a lot lately, and I think what he's interested in is developing better bindings for QT. Mm -hmm. Because CLASP has CLASP has Clang built into it. You can write common list programs that do introspection of C++ code. You can automatically build foreign function interfaces. You could use it for that. So we can automate the process. It's like, you know, SWIG? Mm -hmm. You know no. that thing? SWIG um, is a disease. So SWIG, you know what it is? <laughs> it's um, a disease. <laughs> it's, uh, I can build a super SWIG, basically one that knows common list, or C++ because it has a C++ compiler that's maintained by Apple and Google. And we could automatically build FFIs for any C++ library to common list. That's a, that's a tool that's waiting to be tapped. And then we could massive, for every implementation, could take advantage. So class would be the tool that would let you build FFIs for every other common list. Be a gateway for that. So is this this Python exposure would be class specific, or would be more generic? Yeah, that's going to be class specific. Okay. That's just a twinkle in my eye right now. Yeah. I have a lot of those. So we should probably uh, wrap it up. Okay. Well, thank you very much for inviting me.